Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Father in heaven, thank you for this community. Thank you for the things you're doing amongst us. Thank you that uh, we can come to you in all different ways of being. And broken, excited, grumpy, tired, and you accept us in all those spaces. And you invite us into something greater and richer. So Jesus, uh, we submit um, to your cross. We uh, jump for joy in your resurrection, and we look forward to your return. Holy Spirit, we ask that um, you give us courage today to believe what is true and to push aside what is false. And I ask that in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so this is, uh, we're not in a sermon series. This is just a one-time thing. And I want to start by just talking to you a little bit about story, Uh, because all of us live our lives based on stories. We're constantly telling stories. And stories, when we tell them about our lives, give us purpose and identity and meaning, right? The stories you tell. And this makes us different than animals. In fact, we so much dislike that idea that animals don't tell stories about us, that we tell stories about them telling stories about us, right? Because it just gets so upsetting to us. Right, So we tell big stories, like we're Americans, or we talk about our ethnicity, or we talk about um, you know, what part of the country we grew up, and that's a story about who we are, and it gives us identity. Um, we tell stories like I have, an, in really simple ways, I have an email address that's jedipastor at gmail.com. That tells a story, right? The word Jedi has a whole big story behind it, and so does pastor. So when I'm talking about who I am, I think about that when I go into a room and I'm going to sit with one of you. You should know that I'm imagining myself in brown robes with a lightsaber and a Bible. That's kind of how I view myself. Right? So we tell big stories, but we also tell really small stories, right? Your stomach growls, and unlike an animal, you don't immediately just look for something to put in your mouth. You begin to tell a story and you think, well, I'm hungry, growling, because I didn't have breakfast. And I didn't have breakfast because I ate this really late dinner because I was busy doing something for dinner because the kids were kind of crazy. I didn't eat anything. Right? So you just told a story about why your stomach growled and it gave you purpose and meaning, right? It gave you some sense of who you were and who you are. But we also tell, we have to tell these stories with other people. We don't tell them in a vacuum, right? We use one another to tell stories. We tell stories about each other. And we use a lot of nonverbal cues. So if I'm standing over by the door with my arms like this and I've got my head down and one of you want to talk to me, you're going to begin to tell a story about, oh, Eric looks like he's pretty stressed out. Right. And I don't, uh, maybe he's, and I, I said that mean thing to him and I don't want to go over there and talk to him right now. He's going to just even be more upset. Could be that I just have gas, right? And I, or I'm cold, but you are telling a story. But even then with my arms crossed and my head down, I'm telling a story. I'm thinking I'm cold. I don't feel good, you know, and I'm crossing my arms. I'm beginning to tell a story, right? We're always telling stories to figure out who we are, what kind of meaning. What's our identity? Now, Paul opens up a letter to the Thessalonians, and it says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. So he opens his letter with characters of a story, he and his friends writing to the church in Thessalonica, right? But he then gives them identity, right? All of you in God, in Christ, in the Lord, right? There's this identity. And then this identity comes with grace and peace, right? He's offering that to them. So us as followers of Jesus, so if you're a follower of Jesus, your allegiance is with him, then you're in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and you carry grace and peace. And grace and peace for a follower of Jesus are narrative devices, for us. They're identity devices. When we go anywhere, the thing that you and I carry is grace and peace. Now, grace is God's unmerited favor, right? I didn't deserve Jesus' death on the cross, and I'm given freedom from death in his resurrection. 
And so I carry that grace, right, where I go, anywhere I go. But you know what, in its most simplest thing, grace means charm. Like it's a char- like it's a kind of this grace. Like you're offering a charm, like you're a charming person. You offer grace to someone. Right? So you carry that, that deep, meaningful thing, but it's also a light thing. Grace is not a heavy thing, right? You carry that where you go. You carry Jesus' Uh, God's unmerited favor. But then you also carry his peace, which is linked to grace. But his peace, Jesus and John says, I give you peace, but not peace like the world gives, right? I actually give you garden peace. Remember, we talked about this a little bit. Nowhere in the garden narrative before the fall is ever the word peace used, because that actually is what peace is. People walking with God in the cool of the night, a garden shaped for them, a beautiful relationship that's what peace is so you bring god's unmerited favor and the deepest richest intimacy of god peace to wherever you go and that is a literary device and that is the power of the kingdom is that you can tell this story over and over again to yourself and to others and it's transformative because it brings us all into a relationship with jesus so Today, we're going to be talking about what happens here on Sunday, why we do what we do. And I would like to say that what I hope you experience when you come to the village on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening is that you're encouraged, that at some level, you're given courage to live your life in Christ. And at some level, you are comforted in the places where there's sadness and difficulty. And in some way, you're urged to love and good deeds, that you're pushed towards God, that you're encouraged, that you're comforted, and that you're urged towards the way of Christ. That's what I hope happens here. Now, we're going to be talking about this word called liturgy. Liturgy is actually what happens, right? It's the public worship, why we do each little thing and, and each little practice. So if you were to just to type liturgy into uh, the Google, Um, You might get the way we collectively worship something or engaging in a practice that honors an idea. Um, The interesting thing about the word liturgy is it had to do with tithes, public tithing to gain honor. So the wealthy tithing to help the poor and giving honor for that. And it was a public thing. And it kind of originates that from there. But what liturgy is for us at the village and for any church that follows Jesus is the public proclamation of the gospel through practice and ritual. Right? It's the public proclamation, so we are publicly proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the victories of Jesus, through particular practices and particular rituals. Right? And that's what you're doing when you come here on Sunday. The practice and the ritual help tell a story, and the litur- that's what a liturgy is. It's a story. Now, it's a story that recalibrates you. Because you and I are at war. You all practice lots of liturgies. You may not know this, but you practice lots of liturgies. So let's just talk about some of the liturgies that you practice. First, let's talk about the liturgy of Facebook. So not all, some of you I know have gotten off Facebook, but many of you are on Facebook, and it's on your phone. So you flip. And you read all the things that your friends are saying and your friends' friends are saying, and then you click on their links and you go out. And those links and that stuff you're reading gives you purpose, meaning, and identity. It has a message that it's speaking to you. And you are practicing that liturgy, and it is shaping the way you think about yourself and how you tell stories. Same for those of you who love Instagram, right? You flip through Instagram, and you look at the pictures of your friends. And you're looking at, I have one that's called My House Ideas. And it's every house that I could never have, right? And, but they're really cool ideas. Like the one that I showed Mark was this guy, he's in this cool house, and he walks out the door, jumps into his infinity pool, and from his infinity pool, he jumps into a perfectly clear ocean. Right? I'm never going to have that house. But I think that's something that I'd want that would help me. Right? You see that the, I'm practicing this liturgy. But some of you may be like, ah, I don't do the electronics thing. I'm not really into that, but I bet you you're at least into some form of storytelling. So you like to watch movies, you like Netflix, you like Hulu, you like all those kinds of things. And so those visual things are telling a story and those stories have values. For instance, I really just needed to get out of the house, 
So I went and saw with my son Minions. Yay, Minions, yay. Well, you know, at the very end, in case you didn't get the actual like meaning of Minions, they tell you at the very end. They're like, here it is. I'm going to spoil it for you. It's terrible. I, I don't think you'll be able to figure this out in the first five minutes of the movie. It is, find your tribe and never give up on your tribe. They repeat it over and over for the last two minutes. Find your tribe, never give up on your tribe. That's the theme. Well, there's a liturgy. I'm watching a story that's telling me a value system, telling me how I should operate. But some of you might be like, I don't watch movies. I don't like movies. I read books because I'm more important. Well, think about the books that you read. Well, I, I've talked to a lot of you. There's a lot of you who really digest science fiction. Right? That's a lit- there's value systems. There's, you sit down, you have rituals and practices to how you read books, what authors you follow. You have rules to all of these things. I can go on and on right? in the liturgies that we practice. I love what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, the second part of verse 2. He says, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Now, he's actually talking about a very obvious liturgy that he was, the gospel was pushing up against. And that very obvious liturgy had to do with, with idols and all of that kind of stuff. But what happens here on Sunday is designed to recalibrate you And to recalibrate you, it will push against your liturgies that aren't gospel-centered, right? That's the purpose here on Sunday. That's why we do each thing, is to help you readjust the story you're telling and get back in line with what Jesus has invited you to do. And you might, in some way, in your heart, find some opposition to that as you practice these things when you come together. All right. So one other thing before we jump into the actual things that happen is that liturgy calls us. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, second part of 12, it says, Live lives worthy of God who calls you into the kingdom and the glory. The liturgy, what happens here on Sunday, the different practices, calls us into the kingdom and calls us into the glory. So what's the kingdom? Well, if you look at 1 Peter 2, for those of you, we preach on this all the time, we sing the song, but we are a holy nation, right? A, a, a nation of priests. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a royal priesthood, it tells us in First Peter 2. Well, if you're a royal priesthood, what do priests do? Well, they bind up wounds, and we also know from the text that we declare the praises of the one who brought us out of the darkness and into the light. So the call of the liturgy is to remind you of your identity, royal priest, and to remind you of what you're called to do, bind up wounds and proclaim a movement out of darkness and into light. That's what you should experience. Along with that, you should also experience the glory. You're called into the glory. So what does that mean? What is glory? Because that's kind of confusing, but all of you have glory. It's a weightedness. Michael has a glory. If you go sit with Michael alone, you're going to feel a weightedness of his personality, right? You're going to feel that. If we go hang out, when you go hang out with Ben and Christy, they have a glory, a weightedness of their personality, which is then expanded by the Spirit of God in them. But the glory of God, without getting way too theological, is the very fullness of everything that God is, right? His holiness and the depth of intimacy and relationship that you can experience of Him, right? So what's beautiful about that is just for a second, if you think about holiness in the context of glory, holiness, God's holiness is so other that when there is any kind of sin, it devours it and consumes it and destroys it. So for us to be called into the glory of God, the majesty of God, and not to be devoured, it means that by the Spirit through the Son, we have come to the Father and we play like little kids in front of a God who created us and who is offering the depth of who he is to us. So the liturgy is to call you, and I just wrote this little thing, each Sunday through the liturgy, we are given the opportunity to recalibrate back into the kingdom and back into our relationship with God, to taste the holiness of God, to taste the glory of God, to taste our identity, to taste what we're called to and practice that a little bit. So that's to set the foundation. All right, so 
Here we go. We're going to go through what we do. So first part of our liturgy is called the car. Surprise. The liturgy does not start here in the building. It starts in the car. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. All right. There's this interesting word. It's consider. It means that there has to be some kind of intention. So on a Sunday morning, the invitation of the liturgy of the village is for you to wake up and to say, God, who is it that you want me to sit with today at church? Who do you want me to encourage or spur on or irritate or gently nudge towards love and good deeds? Who who, who do you want me to do that with? Have an intention about that, right? That's the first invitation. And then if you look at verse 25, it says, do not give up the meeting together as some are in the habit of doing and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's this idea that the place that you and I are going to find a richness of being moved towards love and good deeds is when a whole bunch of people will get together to worship God and intentionally are looking at how to encourage one another. And they're doing that because they're in, already in dialogue with God. Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to sit with? Who do I need to offer comfort? Who do I need to challenge to move forward? I do this a lot with a notebook. I will write your name down and a few things that I want to ask you about. I know that's very pastory, but it's a good practice. It's the first part. It's the car part of the liturgy. All right. Second part is my favorite part, the holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12 Greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, we have a lot of controversies over a lot of issues when it comes to scripture interpretation, but we never argue over the holy kiss. We just don't do it. Even though we're told 14 times in the New Testament that we should do it, right? We do not do the holy kiss. So how does, and what does the holy kiss look like? And why is Paul saying this? And why is he asking us to do this? Okay, so at the village, you get here at 10 minutes till the hour or 10 minutes after. But that 20 minutes right there is our holy kiss time. And here's why I say that. I'll explain it all to you. But first, when you get here, you notice we don't have greeters. That you are, if you're newish, somebody will tell you the refrigerator is yours. The living room, you can sit anywhere. You, you want to go wander around and figure things out? Go do that. Look at the art. Like, it's very level here. This is your house, right? This is your place. As soon as you get here, you're responsible for it. And you're responsible to invite other people into it. And we even have notes, you know, on the refrigerator that says, if you're nine and under, go get a parent. How many nine or unders get a parent? Uh, it depends on how long they're there and how sneaky they are. Because even they, they think the refrigerator is theirs too, right? They can't reach as high, which is handy. Um, but this holy kiss thing, well, why is, why is Paul saying this is it just kind of a throw-off phrase no guess what if you were a senator you would never kiss a tradesman and welcome if you were a slave you would never get a kiss from your master if you were a woman a woman of a different class you're not going to agree in class and kissing right the kiss paul took this thing that divides people and is very intimate and says hey we have a bond and other people are excluded and he said, no, 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 we're going to take this thing and we're going to make everybody do it. Right? This is the way we're going to greet people with this holy kiss. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about church history, you'll find out somewhere in the third century they banned the holy kiss because they started having holy kiss lines and it just got out of hand. Let's just say that. It's true. You can go look it up. Um, Okay, to, you know, sometimes people just focus on the wrong things. But, um, but the idea there is that you and I are the same in Christ. I mean, not like identical, but we don't, there's no class here, right? The greatest in the kingdom of God is the one who serves. And so the beauty of it, my, my, I always just think through what it must have been like to have a slave, and then you go to church with your slave, and he's the elder, Right, so you are owning your own religious lead, or like religious authority. Like, this is a weird dynamic, and you you're kissing him, and he's your brother, and it creates this beautiful like intimacy and a breaking of what is already broken in in society. It's like it's changing it and transforming it simply because you have to kiss your slave, and he kisses you and cares for you spiritually. That's just mind blowing to me and exciting because that's what the gospel does. 
is it changes things. And so for us, that 20 minutes, it is our holy kiss time. It's the time for you to pop down with somebody maybe you don't normally talk to and find out how they're doing, right? Go get a soda. Welcome people who are new, that kind of thing. All right. So the second part of the liturgy is the call to dinner. Let me just read 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 11 to you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you because we love you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Now, I just read this not to break this passage down, but for you to hear one thing, that Paul is saying, we dealt with you like mom and dad. We cared for you like a mom and dad. We engaged you like a mom and dad. This part of our liturgy, the call to worship, I like to call the call to dinner. Rod, usually, or one of the elders, so very fatherly, comes up here to do the call to worship. He did that this Sunday. While that's happening, nine times out of ten, Mark and I, or Mark usually now, has taken this responsibility. He's out there herding people into the sanctuary, right? Well, at my house, there are lots of people who live in my house. So when it's dinner time, you go from door to door yelling, it's dinner, dinner, dinner time, dinner time. And most people get there. But then there's this slot where, right now, Elliot's filling, where as soon as the call to dinner happens, the person disappears. And we're all sitting there and like, where's Elliot? It used to be Julie, like, but now she's really gotten into getting to dinner. So somebody takes that place, but it's very family-like. And, and dinner in our house is a big, big deal. Everybody sits down, everybody eats, we talk about life and what's happening. Well, when Rod gets up here or I get up here, one of the elders and says, I'm calling you to worship, he's calling all of us to dinner, to the, to the, to the plate that's being laid out for us in worship of God. And he's saying, this is really, really important, and this is a sacred space. And Mark's out there saying, get into the sacred space, get into the sacred space, it's time for us to all do the thing, right? So when he gets up here, I want you to imagine, it's call the lunch, call the dinner, that's what it is, and it's a very fatherly and motherly thing, like your elders are saying, we're all come to dinner, it's time for you to worship, it's time for you to eat. All right, and then you get a couple things that happen. Number one, usually, though I noticed this week we didn't sing as loud, usually you sing loud songs. Now, it used to be in our liturgy that we had shakers until covid so we would have this big basket of shakers, and we would pass them out, and people would shake them very loud, right? Um, and then COVID, none of us wanted to wash the shakers. Um, but little kids, I can remember the little kids, like when we stopped having the shakers and everybody started to get back together, they were very upset that they were not able to walk the basket around and have people take the shakers. And we may reinstitute that once we have disinfected them all. Um, but... Psalm 150 tells us that we're supposed to sing loud, make loud noises. And if you know anything about Jewish history, you know that when they're headed up to the temple and and during the procession of the ascent, the Psalms of Ascent, they're going up to the temple and they're singing loudly. They're entering into the courts of God, making noise. It's an announcement that we're here, right? So we're loud, and then we have confession, right? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Like, Confession is a really interesting thing because you loudly proclaimed you're here and now you're given an invitation to say, I am not reg- I'm not calibrated. Here are the places where I'm not calibrated, where I have been buying in to a different liturgy, to a different story. And you're given a moment to just settle down and to say, you know what, I, I, there is parts of my week where I have just shifted my value system away from the gospel and away from what is good and right. And then to own that, we say it corporately. I really loved the confession this week because it was like, boom, you, you hear you're, dis, you're not calibrated and this is the only way to be calibrated. And we said, okay, God, you know how we're not calibrated. So we're, confession is this moment where we all have to wrestle with, yeah, you know what? We buy into, oh, my battery is low. We buy into 
all the other ways of understanding who we are. And so here, on a Sunday, we're given this opportunity to recalibrate things. And then we read Scripture. And Hebrews 4, uh, 12 says this, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. One of the reasons that you stay standing and the person says, please stand for the reading of Scripture, is that when we stand, especially when we're sitting in couches, we're saying, I'm vulnerable, and I'm going to sit here and let, I'm stand here and let the words of God be read over me. Now, Hebrews believed a, a particular thing about words, that once they were spoken, you don't have power over them, and they have their own supernatural power. So right in Proverbs, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Right, The words we speak can transform people. So the writer of Hebrews is picking up on that and saying, guess what? The word of God, when it is spoken, has, has the right effect and it will cut you apart. So that first part of our service, from the singing to the confession and then to having the scripture read over us, we're saying we need to be convicted. We are preparing ourselves for a recalibration. Let these words transform us. We're acknowledging that and being willing to have that put over us. So that's the first part. The next part of our liturgy is the children. And you see the children, they all come up here, and I love this. Matthew uh, 19.14 says, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I think it was an illustration of it today. This is the most sacred space, and this is where a most important spot or time during the service. Because what you get to see is all of these children come up where the word of God is spoken, right? So where I stand up and speak, where communion is taken. And they all sit out here and the pastor gets on the same level as they do. And then they feel this freedom to yell out anything, right? And they think they're, they're just so happy to be there. And if you read under Neath the words, especially when you read Matthew, but when you read the Gospels, you can pick up a sense just from the few moments that Jesus talks about children that he loved children and he was constantly interacting with him and they felt safe around him. And the way that Mark models that safety and the way that they feel free should be a, a message to us of like, hey guys, as you recalibrate, this is actually who you're supposed to be. This is what it looks like. This is what the kingdom of God looks like, where there's no guile, where people just throw out the answer. You know, what is the value? Somebody who loves God. You know, like, I don't know if I'm a villager. Like, there's all of this, like, this honesty that adults are like, yeah, no, we don't need to talk about that. Like, we just won't say anything. But they, they're not there. And so it's beautiful because they feel free to own it. And the invitation from this to you in our liturgy is own it. Own your childlikeness. Be a child in the kingdom of God. Right? Be a child. Be free with Jesus. He loves you. He's interested in you. He wants you to get to the place you need to go. He's willing to kind of walk alongside you just like you would walk alongside your own child. He's excited about it. So this is modeled for you. And then they go off to do that. And then we get, well, actually, they don't go off because they do the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, or the values with us. And I, I think this is really important. Um, I call this part of the liturgy the stats, right? So, and this is why it's really, really important. Uh, think about me. I'm, I'm six foot three. I'm like 260 something. I've got two kids. I've got a wife. I like painting little miniatures. I love board games. I have over 120 of them. Um, I live in a house, a community house. These are my stats. You can't change my stats, right? But if someone said, hey, I was hanging out with Eric, and he's really skinny and interested in, in, in the, all of these robotics things, and he's also a good pastor, you'd say, I don't know, are you, are you talking about Eric Lewis or are you talking about Eric Seepin? Like, right? Because there's a, a contrast in stats. So the other thing, though, is I just lay, I offered all those stats to you, but all of you have different experiences of me. Some of you are like, he's really intimidating. Some of you are like, eh, he's kind of grumpy. Some of you are like, wow, he's really offered good things to me. 
And so you all have different experiences, and some of you can clump together and say, oh yeah, we're the people Eric really loves. Oh, we're the people Eric gets mad at. Oh, we're the people Eric wants. Right? So you form Eric denominations, right? But this is how it works, and this is why we say the Apostles' Creed once, you know, every three weeks. Why? Because we want to come back as a community and say, this is who God is. This is who God the Father is. This is who God the Son is. This is who God the Spirit is. And we anchor in on this, right? It's the facts. It's the thing we anchor ourselves into, and we want to repeat it over and over again because our experience of God sometimes is different. And we need to be brought back to its most basic. We say the Lord's Prayer, not necessarily for the stats, so to speak, but because it reorients us and recalibrates us, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There's no me's in that. My's. The Lord's Prayer is a reorienting prayer. It's saying, look, this is not about you. It's about God and about his name and our response to that. So, it's a re- so we're reorienting. The stats reorient us. And then last, our values... We say those, we started adding those because we want our little kids to know what we value. Because we think that the values of the village, our six values, give us an identity and a way to tell our story, but they're what Jesus values. Jesus was authentic and it was accessible and he valued community and he was disciplined, right? And he was the truth and he was creative. You think of the way he healed people. He did not do it a standard way. He did not form, like, you, you, don't, you can't write a book. The standard way to heal people by Jesus. The five easy steps. No, he did it very differently. Each time he was creative. And look at all of you. I mean, if you look around this room, like just the beauty of God's creative power, none of you look like each other. And each of you has this really cool uniqueness that I personally enjoy. I would not like it if you all looked the same. That would be disturbing. Right? There's a. <laughs> he would. <laughs> I wouldn't know who's who. All right, let me get to the announcements. Um, and I hate the announcements, I'll just be honest with you. I hate giving them, I hate doing them, but the announcements are really, really important. We, I say the same things over and over and over again. This happens at our, our table at our house. And usually, do the dishes is the most common announcement at the Seneca din- dinner table. Or, you have not done the dishes, or the dishes are not getting done the way they need to be, or please do the dishes. And like recently last week was, hey, the toilet's leaking, who's going to fix it? Right? So these are announcements, they're how you get your life to go, like how you know what's going on in the community, or how you know what's happening in your house and what needs to be done. Announcements are important, they just really are hard to log into our head, right? So you should listen to the announcements because they'll tell you all the different touch points where you can recalibrate yourself other than Sunday, right? Hopefully, they give you a recalibrating space. Also, just as a side note, if you listen to Healing the City podcast, you'll find out a lot before the announcements happen. All right, and then we go to the sermon. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You'll notice something. In 20 years, probably, I don't think ever, have we ever defended why we use the Bible. Because the Bible, we talk about it and have often talked about it as as the authoritative community member of our village, of our community. So, All of us can teach what we think is good and right. All of us can even offer rebuke and correction and training in righteousness. But none of us are the ultimate authority on any of those things. And so we always look to Scripture as the authoritative community member who says, no, 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 this is what you need to know. This is where you need to change your behavior. This is how you you need to be corrected. And here, let us show you how to walk in righteousness. So when we're speaking from Scripture, what we're saying is this Bible, these 66 books, canon, which, by the way, comes straight out of the Greek into the English meaning measuring rod, right? This canon is what helps us walk calibrated to Jesus and to tell a story where our purpose and identity and meaning are wrapped up in the gospel, right? So that's why I don't go somewhere else. 
Right? This is where we know Jesus. If you don't want the scriptures to be the authoritative community member, you'll have to go somewhere else because that's what we accept to be our living, active community member, the Bible. So I love our time because most of the time when the pastor can talk fast enough and speak short enough, there is opportunity for all of you to engage. And one of the most beautiful things to me is that it's not just me or Mark, whoever's speaking, who has studied and the Spirit has moved and we're speaking. But as we speak, the Spirit is speaking to you. And I like the end when you get a chance to respond because so many times I've stood up here and one of you have said something and it's like, yep, that was the thing that was missing in the sermon. And the Spirit said, hey, we don't want you guys to leave before you hear this. And I think that's so powerful. And in, again, in a way, it says, even though I'm the one who studied and I'm standing up here, so I have a little bit of power, you have, it's flattened it out because you have the Spirit of God and you can speak truth too as the Word has been spoken over you. And I think that's really important because it means you have something to offer at all moments. Right? You're the, you're, and that's important. All right. We'll go through these really quickly. Um, so, these are the responses to the word being spoken. Number one, giving. So we, you know the spiel. I say you can give. But here's the thing. If you're a villager, you should be giving because what you're saying is, I like this space and this space helps recalibrate me and I want to fund the place that recalibrates me into the world and helps me line my liturgies up in the right way and proclaiming the gospel. And I want the people who do that to be able to eat and pay for rent. Right? I, want, I want that to happen for them, and I want this all to happen. The healing chair that Peter is sitting in. You have this opportunity to publicly say, I have a brokenness. My body, my soul, my heart, right? my mind. I need someone to pray for me. And you can go sit in that white chair and say, community, ministers of the gospel, come, put your hands on me, pray for me, I need healing. Now, communion, at the village, we take it every week. And I grew up in the church, so I don't know how many of you um, grew up in the church. I know a lot of you haven't, or you've had different experiences. Um, But for me, this passage in 1 Corinthians, where it talks about how you're not to take communion or God's body unworthily, like really got me. And what I was taught was that I had to confess every single sin before I took communion, or I would be dr- drinking and eating condemnation on myself. Right? And so I often in my church, which by the way only took communion quarterly, would let the communion table go by. So sometimes I wouldn't take communion at all in years because I was afraid that for sure there was some sin that I hadn't confessed that I would drink condemnation on myself. This is how kids' minds work, right? Eventually, I realized that the only way I can drink condemnation on myself is to go up and take the bread and juice and say, Jesus, you didn't save me. You aren't God. You did not die on the cross for my sins, and I take this in mockery of you, right? That's the only way I can drink condemnation on myself because broken, sinful people need the broken body and the blood poured out for them, and coming and taking it, that's what it is. It's saying, I need this. This is, you saved me. I, I can't live without this, right? That, and that's why I love that we take it every week is that we come up and we're saying that over and over again. I can't live without the broken body and the blood of Christ. I can't make it. Like, I don't, I mean, I don't literally need the bread and the wine. I need the broken body of Jesus and the blood poured out for me. So the encouragement is after you've heard the word to come with that kind of heart of I just need this. I need it. I know I need it. And then last, singing. At the village, we, you know, people say, well, oh, I don't know all the songs or I've never heard any of these songs unless they're hymns. We take seriously that you should sing a new song, which is referenced in, in uh, Ephesians 5 and in other places. And, but also when we first started the village, what we realized is that people don't read their Bibles and they struggle to read their Bibles or they've never even had a Bible. So we said, let's start writing music where we're singing scripture. So for 20 years, we've been singing scripture. We wrote almost a hundred some odd songs, right? And we like, we 
Jonah's prayer, Luke 6, Isaiah 55, Isaiah 61, Psalm 46, Psalm 148, Psalm 139. Come on, people, give me some more. Psalm 23. And we could go on and on. Romans 12, Philippians 2 and Philippians 3, Romans 6. We sing all of these songs. You sing scripture over and over again. And you might think, well, I don't know where to hear all of these songs. Well, get a SoundCloud account. Get a Spotify account. Get a Pandora account. Any streaming service, right? You can listen to the music and learn it. Now, yes, sometimes that separates us, and we try to sing hymns so that we can kind of hold on to our heritage as a church connected to the larger church. And you may notice that we sing really cool, we're starting to sing a cappella hymns to kind of reconnect us to the ancient part of things and to connect us to different people's story in our church. But for us, singing in response is saying, you know what, we're going to sing the Word of God over each other. Because when we sing... There's something about music that changes our heart and makes us more receptive to hearing God's word. So we want to be very careful what we sing. So we sing. And then when we're done singing, I get up here, someone gets up here, and we do happy birthday. 1 John 3, 2 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that the, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I love happy birthday for a number of reasons, but one, I think it's a small taste of this. First, these people come, people come up, and you guys come up, and some of you who don't even like to come up, come up. And you stand there, and all these people sing really loud happy birthday. And it's, you get into it a little bit, especially if the people up here getting into it. And then when it's done, everyone looks at each other awkwardly. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, and he walked down. And it's hilarious. It's just every time there's this awkward pause. I don't even know what to say. Thank you for having a birthday. That's nice. But this moment is everyone saying, you know what? You're special. We're willing to sing to you. We love you. We're going to sing at the top of our lungs to you. And in a way, it's saying, you know what? We see you, and we know you, and, and we're seeing you how Jesus sees you want to celebrate you and tell you you're important because there will be a moment when you see jesus and we all see jesus and we will see one another the way we're supposed to be like in our fullness and that for me when i sing happy birthday is what i think about i'm just so much looking forward to seeing these people in their fullness when jesus reveals them so i'm very very i just love happy birthday so that happens and then the blessing and the eating truly i tell you whoever Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 18. Rod usually, though others, come up and offer a blessing. And that blessing is actually a binding. What he is doing is binding everything that has happened here and telling you not just go out, but go out with this hour and a half and take it into the world. Take grace and peace and begin to tell your story calibrated to the gospel and then we eat together and usually somebody works very hard to cook for us and there's something very powerful about eating because eating we all have to do to survive so there's an acknowledgement that we all need it but to eat you have to be vulnerable at some level you have to be vulnerable it actually changes the way conversation happens and so the invitation is when you sit down go find the person you thought intentionally about and sit with them and share a meal and actually ask intentional questions. Ask them, you might have noticed that a question has been going around of what was the best thing that happened in your week or today? It's a very powerful question. Ask them that question. If they can't find that, then say, hey, tell me what's going on so I can pray for you, so I can hear more of your story. Ask people to tell them your story, their story. This is a point where you get to practice a little bit of what you have learned in the service. So, there you go. There is the village liturgy. Eventually, I suppose an added part to this liturgy should be Eric kicking everyone out of the building at two or three o'clock, because he's gotta go, or Mark, right? There is a moment when those of you who, who are uh, stragglers 
and we'll just stay here until someone tells you to go. <laughs> um, stays. So anyway, that's it. I actually, because we cut some stuff, I probably have time for questions if you want to ask questions. If not, we will close. So it is open if anyone has a question or a thought. Or maybe the Holy Spirit was telling you something that you want to say. Otherwise, you are. All right. Let's pray then. Father, thank you for this community. Thank you for um, just this opportunity to understand why we do what we do. And I just ask that you would use all of it to get us excited about being in your kingdom, about inviting people into your kingdom, and about being priests um, who need to be consistently recalibrated and resent out every week. And so I ask all of that in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>